little bonus episode here this week. It is Shrine Bowl <laughs> roster reveal day. We're about a week out uh, from the start of all the festivities in Frisco at the Star, the Cowboys facility. That's where the Shrine Bowl is being held this year. Uh, which I don't think you could ask for a better location considering the quality of the facilities out there in Frisco. Uh, everybody's going to have literally everything they need. We have Eric Galco, Director of Football Operations and Player Personnel at the Shrine Bowl, talking over some of the best players that we got going to Frisco this year. How you doing? I'm doing great, Brian. I appreciate it. We are very excited to be in Dallas. It's literally the best facility in the NFL when it comes to practice and probably college football too. So, um, huge for our players to be there, and I am fired up for this year's Shrine Bowl because it's the best event I think we'll have in terms of event operations, media access, player player piece of it for sure, too, and then obviously some awesome players that we're excited to talk about today. Well, I'm going to cut right to it because everybody uh, loves talking about quarterbacks, and uh, the yeah. Shrine Bowl recently has had some pretty darn good ones, uh, you know, with Brock Purdy, Aiden O'Connell got some starts this year, DTR got some starts this year, uh, and I you know, we we still haven't filled out the entire quarterback room yet because everything always comes down to the last minute in All Star season. But there's some pretty high profile names there this year. Uh, I would love for you to start us off talking about Devin Leary. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, we're going to fill out our quarterback room here. Uh, last year, a little behind the scenes, we um, had been talking with and waiting with Will Levis and Stetson Bennett up until the very last week of of this time last year, and and Will unfortunately was still banged up in the season, and Stetson again, banged up from a national championship run at that time as well, too. Both those guys opted not to attend the Shrine Bowl, but as far as I know, we're planning to attend if they could. Um, so this year, a little bit similar situation. I'll kind of keep that a little bit guarded right now. Um, but overall, Devin Leary start with him. I mean, extremely well-known by NFL circles, right? Had a great college career at NC State, went to Kentucky, tough situation in SEC to kind of have a highly productive year. But really by the second half of that year, this year, he showed who he was at NC State. And NFL teams know that this guy is an NFL quarterback, right? Whether he's a starter or not, who knows, similar to kind of a little bit like Brock Purdy, right? Where this guy's going to play in the NFL for a long time. Once he gets in the building, we'll see what happens. But NFL teams feel very confident in Devin Leary as a person and as a player now that he's fully healthy and, and showed who he was the second half of last year at Kentucky too. So he's definitely one of the quarterbacks NFL teams are most fired up to, to look at. And I think if he has a good week and a good draft process, sometime mid to early day three is, is definitely within his range. Yeah, fantastic amount of starts and a lot of snaps for a college quarterback, a lot of starting yeah. snaps at high-profile programs, so not a guess by any estimation. Another guy that's got a ton of snaps at a lot of high-profile programs, Caden Slovis. Talk yeah. us through him. Yeah, I mean, geez, four years ago, you'd think this guy's going to be first-round pick and and really a little bit out of his control, you know, goes from, from USC and kind of gets hurt, right, and loses his job. Classic scenario we've seen a lot in college football – goes to Pitt. That season is not really successful for Pitt either. doesn't have a great supporting cast around him. Then goes to BYU and their offensive line wasn't really rebuilt. The running game wasn't there. I'm not trying to cast blame a little bit, but I think if you, I tell people all the time, I think if you replay Keaton Slovis' college career 10 times, like eight of those times, he's a top two round draft pick. And the talent's the same, right? He didn't get worse as a player. He didn't do nothing in the offseason and just see Cheetos, right? Like he's, he's working on his craft. So um, he's still that same talented player. And he's a guy that Many NFL teams requested, hey, if you do have a spot available in the future, too, we'd love to see him kind of out of these maybe less ideal situations. So teams are fired about him for sure. So oddly enough, this year, the biggest name at quarterback at the Shrine Bowl is not going to be practicing or playing because he's still rehabbing from a, a pretty significant injury. Uh, that being Jordan Travis. Yeah. You know, it, we're not going to see him out there on the field. But if we did, what are the traits that kind of stand out to you with Jordan Travis that make him, you know, potentially a very good starter at the next level? You know, the most important trait in my mind for for quarterback evaluation, and that's what guys like Brock Purdy have, that's what guys like Tom Brady have, that's what guys like Pat Mahomes and Lamar Jackson have in very different ways, is the ability to improvise and be cool, calm, and collective, right? And be kind of that game manager when you have to be, but make plays that aren't there when those game manager opportunities aren't there. And, and again, Lamar Jackson and Tom Brady are not similar in a lot of ways, but when the play breaks down, whether it's Tom Brady in the A-gap or whether it's Lamar Jackson in space, these guys are calm and can finish downfield or finish on third down. And that's what Jordan Travis showed his college career, right? He can win from the pocket and allow his really talented receivers this year, Johnny Wilson, Keon Coleman, among others, really thrive. Uh, but I think when the play had breakdown, we had to go on the outside or whether it's a game like Boston College where a game they should have won, they're down, that's a golden opportunity for a, a good team like that and a great quarterback to kind of sink and be like, what's happening? 
Nope, took control, ran the ball, made plays downfield. He's the game manager who can improvise in space. And I think if they're not for injury, this guy's going day two of the draft and, and who knows how early after that. Obviously, the injury is tough, but he's going to make a full recovery. And, and I know NFL teams are going to really enjoy the fact they can interview him at Shrine Bowl week because he's really impressive as a person. X's and O's wise, very impressive. And teams are going to say, you know what? There's not a lot of difference as a person and as a talent to what Hennon Hooker was a year ago that Jordan Travis is this year. Uh, wide receiver this year. It, yeah. It's, it, you know, EJ and I were kind of talking off air uh, before you came on. And we're like, okay, there's no, there's no Zay Flowers where we know going into it, like, oh, that's a first round pick. Like, no, no debate. Yeah. But there might be more top 100 to top 150 guys in this Shrine receiver group than we've seen in the last few years. Like, I, I, I look around and we were, we got like five or six deep and we're like, oh, these are all like legitimate <laughs> yeah. NFL star. You know, um, EJ is already obsessed with Malik Washington. So thank Fair. you for bringing him there. Uh, w- would you say that he's probably going to go earlier than everybody else? I would say based off of, again, not my opinion, they're all my favorite receivers, but I would say based off NFL feedback, he and Isaiah Williams from Illinois are the two guys that, that NFL teams jump out about. I and mean, they've had many opportunities in, in the all-star game circuit. So um, Malik is as productive as any receiver in the country. Um, it's always impressing me a little bit like Zay Flowers a year ago when you are so far and away the best player in your offense and yet you're still getting the ball consistently and not just in all gimmicky stuff. But I mean, he's yeah. doing some dig routes some deep outs some some motions up for short too. They got the ball a lot, but 130 catches this year. I think NFL teams see that. And I was talking to Malik just the other day. And I told him like, Hey man, don't worry about draft stock or whatever else. If you can show NFL teams, you can start early in your NFL career. You're going top hundred, right? Just teams aren't going to pass on those kind of guys. And I think teams made a mistake on pop Douglas a year ago from the shrine bowl. And like that guy was going to start early on. I don't think teams make a mistake on Malik Washington or Isaiah Williams for that matter. I think both those guys with a good week and a good combine testing, I think both those players will be top 100 picks in the draft. Yeah, very different players, but really both yeah. very talented. And Malik, like you said, the thing that impresses me about him is his ability to win all over the field. That when yep. down the boundary, he'll win late in the middle. He's very quarterback friendly. The play breaks down. He's extremely smart. He's tough after the catch. And then you look at, you know, productivity in the ACC is leading the ACC in both catches and yards. And you're like, OK, he can yeah. he can do it. And I think, like you said, people are going to understand that he can start really quickly in terms of the Illinois receiver. A little bit different profile, but a little bit more juice <laughs> in terms of a lot of explosion from behind the line. Um, you know, a lot of exciting plays. Talk about him for a sec. Yeah, I mean, I'm. The name is is part of it, right? But he does some things that Zay Flowers does really well, right? He can win from the slot. He can win outside. He was, I think, the Big Ten's leading receiver this year, uh, far and away. But it's the growth he's made. You know, just we noticed him back in, what, I guess, 2020, um, when he had just gone from quarterback to receiver. And I think it was his first or second game in that season where he just started playing receiver, where he was already being a target in the offense. And when you go from quarterback to receiver, that's fun and all, and I, I'm a sucker for that. But when you can do that and then your first, second game in, you're showing you can separate as a route runner. You can sit in zones. You can adjust after catch and be flexible and fluid. He is a sponge. He's also a big Zay Flowers fan. That's how I got really introduced to him a year ago where he called me and said, hey, you guys had Zay last year. Can you tell me what he did so great? What was his you know, mentality too? So he's a sponge for information as well too. And he'll interview very well as well too. But like I said, I think Malik Washington will be kind of a plug and play slot receiver. Um, and he'll be on our 11 personnel team, so we can kind of get some real work in the slot on the West team. Uh, whereas Isaiah Williams on the East team doing some 12 personnel, and he'll be a little more XZ and also some slot as well during the week too. Bunch of other receivers as well that that really jump out to me. Taj Washington, I mean, you can't watch a USC game without Taj Washington getting like a 40-yarder at some point. <laughs> right. um, the Yankee kids from, from South Dakota State, yeah. I, I still can't figure out um, – <laughs> Which Lucio. like, <laughs> it, not even just that, but separating skill sets because like I was writing, I was watching. I made the mistake honestly watching both of them at the same time last night. Yeah, and I was writing down <laughs> Spider Man. Re- there you go. Yeah, no, I, I did. Sometimes I was like, but I'm just writing the same thing for two different guys, which makes sense because yeah. they're brothers and they're built the exact same and they run yeah. the exact same and they play the same role. But uh, like both of them are are just easy, easy. You see them in the NFL like 100. percent They're going to be on a roster. Um, 
but the one that I'm really intrigued by, uh, the 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 Coker kid from Holy Cross. Yeah, because w- when you watch f- when you watch prospects at that level, the first thing you're thinking of is okay. I don't even want to know your number. I just want to see if you show up without me knowing yep. who to look for. And oh my God, he shows up like clearly the best player on the field. You know, six three, probably north of two fifteen. Got the size, got the speed, got the ball winning ability. How was he at Holy Cross for four years? That's what I want to know. Yeah. I mean, first off, that's my same process too on small school players. I'll know the name, but I won't know the number, position I'll know, and then I'll just like see what happens. Um, And it's crazy because I I remember last year I was at uh, Holy Cross in Fordham because we were kind of deciding if we wanted to buy Tim DeMora from Fordham at that point in mid November. And they played at some point. And DeMora and Ford had a great offense. And I, again, to your point, I didn't know his name at this point. I didn't know anything about him. I wasn't looking at juniors for next year's Shrine Bowl at that point. And I'm like, who the F is this guy um, at receiver for Holy Cross? He's getting double covered. He's getting targeted. He's separating still. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what they did there. I mean, obviously, they had a great coach um, who was one of the rising coaches in college football. And he's now at James Madison. Um, mm-hmm. But he'll be a head coach at a, at a big school if he wants to be. Um, whenever he's ready, he's, he's, he's kind of a unicorn coach in that sense. And that's what they kind of sold him on. But, but Jalen has been incredibly productive. The two questions NFL teams have on him, really the one is, does he have the deep speed, but I've seen the GPS numbers they have, and he's going to test just fine. And I think people don't realize, Hey, this guy's been productive. He's separated that we'll, you know, we were going to invite him anyways, but he went to the Hula Bowl um, and, and showing NFL team we could do there too. dominated that week, as you probably expect, like clearly the best receiver there as a route runner, as a finisher, didn't drop a pass all week, was getting pass interference by midweek because the DBs were, no, they're going to get beat the whole time, still making catches. So I think he'll have a great week for us as well, too, against a lot of future NFL corners. We've got, we get to them later on, we've got a bunch of them going to the top 100 picks. I think if he has a good week here and he runs a 4 4 9, could he go in the top 100 picks? Can't rule it out because the film's undeniable at this point. Yeah, that would be something else having a yeah. having a holy cross receiver in the top hundred. But I'm with you in yeah. terms of when you turn on the film, he is a guy that distinguishes himself. And yeah, at that point, it's testing numbers and and how he shows out in the week, which is one of our favorite things about All Star games is the league is one thing, and then you get in the mix of the top 200, 250 players in the country, and the guys that separate during practice, you go okay. And he could easily be one of those based on his profile. Yep. I want to talk got, about the tight end group. I got because, one more receiver. That's all right, EJ. One more receiver. No, go for Just it. Just on sure. your radar. Tulu Griffin of Mississippi State. Um, okay. Because he will challenge for the fastest time at the combine. Um, Ooh, you can put it in there. Really? I would be floored if he doesn't run a four to something. Um, and that's now, right? So, <laughs> that's so now. obviously, we had, we had Tyquan Thornton a few years ago who – got robbed and and there's a lot of data not trying to be big data guy a lot of data that says he ran a four one something um and maybe got jipped at the combine uh and believe me i can if you look at if you go to tony villani who is a speed coach he's done the whole deep dive and he has made his case that t- taekwondo ran a four one and i'm not saying tulu griffin will do that but he's going to be fast so again i if you got even early odds on it to tulu griffin and the four twos for sure so we'll try to tight ends though ej sorry no, that's fine. We'll tuck that one away. And I mean, look, we could talk about the receiver group all day because it's really deep and we appreciate it. I mean, Cornelius Johnson is yep. maybe not the quickest guy, but boy, is he fast. And when you see him open up on Michigan, he runs by, you know, the Ohio State defensive backs who are not slouches by any stretch. So yep. very, very deep group, fun group, versatile group. Love the fact that they're going to get to split into, you know, two different offensive styles and really go against what we'll talk about in a second, which is a great group of DBs. Uh, tight end. So obviously JT Sanders. Yep. Yeah. I, I, he's still coming back from injury. So who knows if he, if we're going to get to see him practice, but he is there. So he's going to get to knock out all of his interviews with teams, which really, that's kind of an underrated thing. I actually want you to comment on that. Um, and yeah. I didn't know this uh, last year, but uh schoonmaker tight end that ended up going ironically to the Cowboys second round. Knocked out a bunny a bunch of interviews at Shrine last year. And so he only had like 12 interviews to do at Combine. Yeah. Which he's attested that that helped him perform better in drills. And, you know, Sanders, obviously, Texas kid, not that far for him to go. <laughs> right. Do you feel like the biggest benefit to this coming week, whether he practices or not, is just knocking all that out so that when he goes to the Combine, he can just focus on running fast and doing well in drills? 
Yeah, I mean, this sounds weird coming from someone who, who, who runs an all-star game, right? But interviews for 70, 80% of these guys are by far the most important of it, right? Guys like Jalen Coker, Foley Cross, you mentioned, hey, small school guy, he's got to go win that week of practice or a guy making a position change or a guy in a new scheme. Those are really event week practice to it. And certainly we, we want everybody to practice, right? If JT says, hey, you know what? I feel 100% I'm going to go practice. I'm not going to say no, right? Go out there and compete. <laughs> um, but for me, I want these guys to, to leave healthy and be able to perform at the combine. And JT Sanders especially, I mean, he's shown a lot in his college career. He's shown how dynamic of an athlete he can be, how athletic he's going to be at the NFL Combine, what he can do as a versatile chess piece from inline tight end, getting better as a blocker there over his college career and giving more effort. Obviously, being a slot receiver, he can play outside. I mean, he's probably a, a more complete version of what Mike Gesicki has been in his NFL career. But certainly the interview process is important because the draft process is a grind. And that's why we spend so much time on – our NFL and, and media interviews for these guys. So these guys are not feeling rushed all week long, right? You guys are there. You'll be at the Shrine Bowl this year as well, too. You can get 20, 25 minutes with these players and allow them to relax and be themselves versus whether it's a combine or other all-star games where these players are rushed and there's anxiety built up and then it doesn't really suit them for success all week long as well, too. So thankfully we'll have, you know, pretty much every NFL GM there because they know our interview process is great. And for guys like Zay Flowers and Luke Schoomaker a year ago, and hopefully – guys like Jordan Travis and Jonathan Brooks, other players maybe can't perform all week in practice, get a chance to knock out those interviews and make their draft process a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, I can see that shift. And that was something I don't think was widely known is that you can kind of sub one interview for another just because you do it in an all-star game means you don't have to do it at the combine. And yep. even at other all-star games, I mean, you see guys, I've run into guys, you know, players late at night. Like it's 9 no. 45, 10 o'clock, and you, know, you walk heart. into the bathroom and you're like, Hey man, how you doing? Because there's a <laughs> you know, six six guard from Kentucky yeah. there, and he's like, I'm all right, but I'm really tired. And you're like, Oh, you know, are you done for the day? And he's like, No, I've got like four more. And you're yeah. like, Okay, so you're gonna be up till like 10 30. Practice starts tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Like it's a long thing, and these guys are realizing that. If we get these done, we go to Indianapolis, which is always a crammed week and always has been. Hey, I could be a little bit more relaxed. I can have two thirds of those done, just catch the teams I missed and then really get my sleep, get my rest, get warmed up properly and sort of get around a lot of things that have been typical complaints at the combine for a long time. Yep. Yep. So our players start every night at 8 p.m., get some sleep, get some recovery and get back to football. Yeah. That was just getting a full night's sleep. You know, yeah. Eight plus hours. Now, like I, I won't get that full night's sleep, but the players will. <laughs> say, what's that? What's a full night's sleep? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but at least at least they get all the food. Yeah, they the get it. Yeah. Uh, talk about the Holker kid from Colorado State, because I yeah. my first my first impression of him was when I like the rest of America watched the Colorado Colorado State game. Right. And he just annihilated everybody. Yeah. Uh, that was where he first jumped out of my radar. It is is that the game that probably sticks out the most to you is like what, what NFL teams are, are pointing to like, that's what he can be. Yeah. I mean, he, he's been on our radar since the year before productive a year ago too. That was the game. I think, you know, he went from on our board from, Hey, we know this guy, let's keep an eye on him to, you know, push him towards the front of the line in terms of our first invites to the tight end too. And obviously ended the, the season, I think either ahead of or right near Brock Bowers as the most productive tight end in, in the FBS level this year. Um, and I think he's a great fit. Again, he'll be on the East team, which is a 12 personnel, right? And his strength is not going to be in line blocking and 11 personnel or being that lead blocker. It's going to be, hey, we want to get him a little bit unattached or a little bit in space too. And that's where he's great at, right? Those wheel routes he runs, being able to really threaten the seam, finish in traffic, get past linebackers, separate from safeties, which is so important for NFL tight ends to do now if you're going to be a pass catcher. Beating linebackers is easy, but you got to beat safeties in the NFL and matchup coverage or against um, deep zones. And he does that consistently well. So I think the hands, the finishing, the confidence as a route runner, the ability to separate and still the growth he's shown. He made huge strides this year being more of a future weapon in that offense because they had Torrey Horton and he and Torrey Horton back to school at Colorado State. But those are the two guys. And if you have just a, a receiver and a tight end, you can a little bit scheme for those guys. And teams did a good job later in the year. And both those players, especially Dallin Holker, really productive through that. Right? That's what I always look for in, in skill players is – okay, you're the best player in the field and the other team knows that. Can you still win reps whether you're getting the ball or not? I think Holker showed that all year long that he can do that as a receiver. Uh, I want to get to running back because you mentioned Jonathan Brooks a little bit earlier. He's yeah. obviously, obviously also going to be there, also rehabbing from injury, um, yep. You know, kind of staying in state, keeping it close. 
Uh, one connection that he has to the Cowboys that I didn't realize before this week, uh, our, our buddy Dane Brugler brought it up. Um, so the Cowboys team doctor is actually who did Brooks's surgery. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's going to be hanging around the Cowboys facility. You know, some would say that the Cowboys have a need at running back and they're probably going to have the best inside info that you could possibly get for how he's coming along and his recovery and everything like that. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm writing it in pen, but Jonathan Brooks would uh, would certainly look good with a star in his helmet. Yeah, and and no surprise, they actually just got they just nudged it out. But the Cowboys are the most credentialed NFL team at the Shrine Bowl this year, which I expected. Um, something I mean, a couple of teams are bringing 18 people, but they they're bringing the whole staff are credentialed. So you'll see a lot of Cowboys uh, logos in the star, but also in the stands bowl too. Um, there's a lot of Jonathan Brooks, right? And I don't think based on how what I know of his recovery is going. Um, I have no doubts that he'll be good to go at his rookie season. I think teams are going to draft him as if he just opted out of the draft process, not that he's hurt, right? I think he's going to play it safe and hopefully be ready to go and do something towards the end of the draft process. But again, like Jordan Travis, part of our philosophy is, hey, if we invited that player, going to invite that player, we honor that commitment. It, it hurts us a little bit. We got to save that roster spot for a guy like him. And and we have to kind of replace him once once he's officially deemed injured. But um, it's an honor to have him. I'm going to talk to Jonathan a couple of times now and just – smart impressive like he's it's crazy how they can have Bijan robinson and jonathan brooks in back-to-back -back years and not only be immense talents but also like high character guys you want to build your offense around and and johnson be just that for nfl team yeah if uh Richard if he was me. healthy what yeah. would he have run oh uh, i i mean i think he'd be in the four fours comfortably um I think that's where I, mean, I don't know if he might hit a four three. I don't think he'll ever know that, right? Four three is. You I, I think it'd be close. Freaky. Yeah, you got to be freaky fast, and you got to have good, you know, good process. But I wouldn't rule out. Is what I'm saying. Like I, I think, you know, I think in May with no training, if he just like was healthy and ran, he'd be a four four nine with zero training, right? So um, four three is definitely possible, man. But he's he's a special player, and again, one of the cool parts about why the interviews matter so much is. You could just watch the film and you're like, why do I have to see this guy run a 40? I'm, I'm good, right? I know he's fast <laughs> and good player as well, too. Let me talk to the kid and, and be good from there, too. So, no, he'll he'll get a chance to enjoy the experience. He's training in Dallas, so he'll be there all week long and really enjoy himself and be with NFL teams and then get back to rehab. Talk to me a little bit about Carson Steele because a guy that I work yeah. with at Windy City Gridiron is a Ball State alum, and when, when Carson Steele announced that he was going from Ball State to UCLA, he made a point of like, hey, man, I was like, look, I've, I've watched some action games. I get it. And he's like, no, no, Carson Steele. And, and talk to me about the cult of Carson Steele. Yeah, he's one of two junior running backs. I was this year, um, the, the Shrine Bowl and the Senior Bowl can have underclassmen participate in all-star games, and Carson gets a chance to benefit from that. Um, in the past, it wouldn't be able to him and Jaden Sheridan from Monmouth are the two underclassmen running backs we have um, in this year's Shrine Bowl. Carson's physical. I think he'll get some unfair Evan Hall comparisons for some uh, unique reasons, right? But I think Carson is going to test better than people realize. He's been uber productive in the MAC and obviously early on at UCLA, dealt with some injuries towards the end of the year there. But I think for Carson, what he wants to show this draft process, what he will show this draft process, is that he can really be a three down back, right? He can finish as an open field runner, he's got that juice. As an accelerator, he's gotten really good as a pass blocker and has really, I mean, the key part of running back pass blocking is not always technique, but it's effort. And man, does that guy give effort as a pass blocker? And then as a route runner and receiver, like he's more than capable and has the length and size to do an extent away from his frame, too. So I think NFL teams may not view him as a plug and play starter, but I've talked to a lot of teams and we invited them in part because, oh, yeah, this guy's going to make a roster and be one of our three running backs in our rotation as a rookie. And that's what I think he wants to show this draft process. All right, it's time to feel very old. Frank Gore <laughs> Jr. Yeah. is on this man. Monitor. Man, um, you know, it's been great uh, the last year and a half. Got a chance to know Frank Sr., which is crazy to say Frank Gore Sr., <laughs> but we have to say that now. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, Frank Gore Jr. thought about declaring for last year's draft, and I got in touch with Frank Sr. And, and him about that as well, too. But um, I think Frank Gore Jr. is one or two, one of the two best pass blocking running backs in this draft class. Um, which sounds small, but again, that's how you get drafted. That's how you make a roster. And then we've seen a lot of surprising late round PFA running back guys like Isaiah Pacheco, very different player, right? But seventh round pick to starter. And I think Frank Gore Jr. really is that. Um, and and I, I go back to the pass blocking because he's been productive. He's got enough open field juice, not going to be a burner, but he can definitely get downfield. He can make plays in space, very decisive one cut running back. But again, his pass blocking, you'll watch those reps on film. And I have no doubt at the Shrine Bowl, he'll be a stonewaller in that area too. And he'll, he'll show NFL teams, Hey, you've got to put me on your roster and draft me for this reason. 
And by the way, I've put up, you know, 3000 yards in the last two seasons. And that's not a bad thing either. So um, no doubt Frank Gore Jr. is makes me feel old. Um, and Frank Gore will be down there as well. So feel free to hit him up for interviews and talk to him about him and his, him and his son and how they're very different running back styles, same kind of tough mentality. That's kind of where the line draws that in their last name, but, but certainly Frank Gore Jr. One I'm excited to see down there at the Shrine Bowl. Uh, offensive tackle. Yeah. So overall, by the way, just broad statement, EJ and I were kind of sending notes back and forth. We're like, oh my God, this offensive line group is, is really good this year. Like that's always, it, it's crazy. All-star offensive line groups are always a little bit rough because there's just not that many great offensive linemen to go around. Like there's a, there's a shortage of it in the actual NFL, let alone at the college level. This year though, like there's, there's a bunch of guys that are going to start a lot of games in this offensive yeah. line group and probably none that are better, at least in my opinion. I know you don't want to pick between all your kids. <laughs> Garrett Greenfield, I think, is is probably going to be the highest drafted tackle from this group, in my opinion. And I was watching him last night. And the first step is explosive. He's tall. He's long. You know, as a run blocker, I think it's it's more a question of, of how he can get better at weaponizing his size. And we know Duke Mannyweather is going to work on that with him. Um, But as far as tools go, my, and EJ, feel free to disagree with me on this too. I immediately thought, oh, this is this year's Braxton Jones, but he's going to get drafted higher than Braxton Jones was. Just tall, toolsy, could, even if he's not one of the top six tackles taken, I, I could see him starting games as a rookie and being fine. Yeah, I'm totally with you, by the way. And, and he's got a teammate, Mason McCormick, who'll be at the Shrine Bowl as well, too. Who I think teams were kind of either one who was higher. They're both going to be NFL players. I'd be shocked if they're both not firm draft picks. And those are two of five South Dakota State players we have. The two Yankees I mentioned earlier, Zach Hines, their tight end, who's one of the better blocking tight ends in the draft, McCormick and Greenfield. But I get to meet Greenfield and McCormick actually this offseason. And just seeing how smooth Garrett is in space, right? You think, you know, you kind of typecast these guys, South Dakota State, right? Oh, this guy's going to be a grinder. No, like he looks as smooth and athletic as any off cycle in the country. Um, and I think he'll, I think he'll quote unquote rise on boards, but obviously not for you guys, because I think you're properly on him right now too. But he's one of the, I think they're probably at least, I don't want to name names too much, probably four or five offensive tackles we have on our roster who talking with teams are, hey, that guy's going to get beat to start by the middle of his rookie year. And Garrett's one of them. I would agree with that. And you obviously have a great relationship with the South Dakota state program. And when you look at, you know, five, six, seven guys off their offense that are going to be on NFL teams next year, they're really benefiting from that now sort of multi-year rise. We've seen players come out of that program and, you know, scouts have been there and there's always, like you said, you show up on the sideline and you're like, I'm here to look at this guy, but who the hell is that guy? Yeah. He's who's next. So I think fans might be a little bit behind that curve and be surprised when, five or six South Dakota state guys end up in the draft this year, but Crazy. you know, each successive year um, I ended up tuning into, I think three of their games just sort of randomly now that I've got, you know, the YouTube package and ended up watching the national championship game. And, you know, the Yankees were making plays and I was trying to <laughs> memorize which number was which, but the entire left side of the line was just rolling in that game. And it's like, yep, going to get to see both those guys in Texas. So really excited about it. You watched three South Dakota state games this year. I love parts, you. parts, no parts. <laughs> God love it. Arts of South Dakota. I thought I was the only one, but God bless you. <laughs> I, I got a buddy that's on the Mercer staff. And, you know, obviously yeah. they played South Dakota State in the playoffs. And I, I didn't get to see the, the Mercer game live. Um, but I, I was watching the Yankees last night and I, I watched the Mercer game and I texted him. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he just he he seemed like he was traumatized by that game. He's like, there's just there's so many dudes on that yeah. roster. Like it's not a normal FCS roster. Like that's yeah. they could have competed with a lot of FBS teams last year. Again, and I think they're gonna beat. have they're gonna have between four and six draft picks on that team, which will beat most Big Ten teams, right? In this yeah. year's draft. <laughs> and and they got more coming too. So kudos to that program. They've done a great job. Are there any other offensive tackles in this group that really stick out to you that, you know, before we get to next week, like what's our homework to watch? A uh, couple guys I think will will be really impressive that week that people maybe are a little bit underappreciating right now. Julian Pearl of Illinois um, had a shrine one about a year ago, went back to school. I think he's is similar to Garrett in terms of how athletic and natural he is. Um, NFL teams are super bullish on him. I think with a good process, he'll go top 100. Another guy that I think could very well go top 100 that's a little bit of a secret for Southeast area scouts, Nathan Thomas from Louisiana. If you guys haven't watched him yet, definitely dive in. 
he is a guy that we liked anyways, but we kind of pushed him to the front of the line because we, we had him graded in a similar area, but a lot of NFL Southeast area scouts were like, oh no, like he's going to go before a lot of more well-known SEC, ACC guys in our area too. So those are the two guys that I think will really, with a good week of practice, will almost cement themselves in the top hundred big people don't know quite now too. But Caden Wallace at Penn State, he'll be at the NFL Combine. He's tested well. Walter Rouse, a guy we invited a year ago as well, from Stanford, great college career there. Goes to Oklahoma with one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. Blocked two Texas pass rushers in one play to allow Dylan Gabriel to win that game against Texas. One of the greatest offensive line plays I've ever seen. Stopped two Texas pass rushers with two hands to allow Dylan Gabriel to win the game too. Um, I think he'll be a firm draft pick as well too. So again, a really good group. It's it's the deepest offensive line class we've seen in my 20 years of doing this prop. So special class. Wow. Uh, on the interior... Uh, Christian Mahogany is probably going to be the top drafted guy uh, in the Shrine group on the interior. Uh, would you be able to give your impressions on him? Yeah, uh, it's been awesome to see him recover, right? He was a first team All-American, freshman, all, or freshman All-American, then I think a first or second team All-American as a sophomore and, and got hurt a, a year and a half ago that took a long recovery. Um, and get, get, get to know Christian a little bit too, like he took that recovery incredibly serious, right? He's a very pragmatic and thoughtful, thoughtful offensive lineman too. And and he knows, I think he realized after his early on his career that he could be a great player. And he took that to be, I'm going to make sure I'm a great NFL player. Um, and I took, I think it took him a few weeks to kind of get back into the mindset um, at BC this year too. But by the end of the year, he was the same old Christian Mahogany. And I think there are some NFL teams coming into this process that were like, I thought he'd be a first round pick and the first few weeks he wasn't that. And okay, maybe not a first round pick, but you don't let that kind of guy get out of the top two, three rounds of the draft. So I think Mahogany have a great week and a great draft process. And I think he'll run one of the better 40 times in short shuttles at the off into your offensive line position. And, and he'll show NFL teams again that, Hey, I'm the guy I was in 2021, 2022, and I deserve to be a top hundred draft pick. One of my favorite things about this process is guys that have that, blip for whatever reason whether it's injury or transfer we talked about a quarterback that had the same same sort of path and it gets quiet right mahogany was anything but quiet on the interior offensive line he was all in all the preseason all america list and then this year just kind of because of the injury and the slower start like people forgot and then his name pops up on this list and i get like really excited I'm like, yeah yeah this is a chance for him to sort of show and again crank that volume back up and be like nope and I think somebody's going to get a tremendous value because of that, because I think if he hadn't had that interruption, we would be talking about one of those sort of fringe first round, definitely sort of top half of the second round, like without question, still think he has that ability and it's a great chance for him to go out and just kind of, again, like you said, uh, you know, offensive lineman mindset, just put his nose to his craft, go out and say, nope, I'm gone anywhere. You all went somewhere and, you know, come on back. Uh, you have your your fair share of Michigan Wolverines, national champion yeah. Michigan Wolverines. I should correct myself. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I have two questions for you. Number one, uh, is Michigan going to set the record for total players drafted this year? And number two, where is Barnhart actually going to play in the NFL? Because he played four out of five offensive line spots for a Joe Moore winning Joe Moore award winning offensive line. So is he just one of those guys that that you just throw out there during training camp and you figure out who your best five are and he lands where he lands? Like, what what is he? Yeah, well, first off, on the draft picks for Michigan, you know, a lot of the top guys won't play. Mikey Sanders still, Roman Wilson, Blake Corum won't play in an all-star game. They're just one national championship game and they're going to be early picks, so I don't blame them. Um, I, I think they'll have a good chance to do it. And, and to be honest, some of the guys we have here, I think will earn that, including Barnhart, who... Again, maybe not the freakiest athlete, but he's played four positions. He, he's going to get picked for that reason alone as long as he doesn't have a, a bad draft process. And I think it's important for an offensive line group that has so much talent. I mean, they didn't play Ladarius Henderson to start the year. Miles Hitton's going to come back, and he'll be a top four-round guy next year. He was kind of their backup offensive. Like, they had plenty of guys here. Trent A. Jones, who didn't start the first eight games of the year, he'll be at the Shrine Bowl. He played right tackle in their national championship run. We play more guard in the Shrine Bowl week, but don't be surprised if he goes in the top four rounds. And I think NFL teams think he's the most athletic guy on their offensive line last year. All that's to say, the fact that Barnhart, as you mentioned, beat out these guys consistently. And when Zach Zinter goes down, that guard position is so important for a Blake Corum running style. And they move Barnhart in there, not anybody else, right? So 
I think he's shown versatility in a real way and really trust in a team that was not a seven and five or eight and four team, but a national championship team. We're going to put this guy in the positions that are most important for us uh, in this moment too. And then draft pick wise, we'll get to some DBs earlier, but Cornelius Johnson going to get drafted unless, you know, something happens, right? NFL teams have known him for a long time and Trent Day and Barnhart probably as well too. And I think that they'll, they'll have a safe 10. And then after that, it'll be a day three of how many guys can get drafted overall too. But, but that staff did a great job in recruiting. And I think most importantly, development of a lot of these players. Uh, EJ, did any of the interior names, because there's a lot of them, jump out to you that that you just can't wait to talk about? Well, I'm I'm really interested to watch the centers, and that has a lot to do with my rooting interest in the professional ranks. Uh, my team <laughs> needs a center pretty badly, and uh, it would it would definitely hurt my heart a little bit if Barnhart ends up as a Packer, but I feel he probably will because they yeah. love those types. Um, yep. That's just their, their MO. They've done it, you know, three times in the past four years where they've picked up, you know, very versatile guys that don't necessarily have a position or pretty much good anywhere. And guess what? They become great offensive linemen for the Packers. So be great for his prospects, but I'm going to keep a close eye on centers because, um, you know, I think center is one of the most underrated positions in the NFL you see teams consistently that don't have good centers uh, not achieve their potential. Um, quarterbacks hate pressure from the middle, and if the center can't get things straight, which is typically their job in the NFL, and also block, um, a lot of offenses don't achieve their potential. So I'll have a close eye on centers because everybody that I work with at Windy City Gridiron is like, what about the centers? Tell me about the centers. Show me the centers. I was like, guys, I got you. No problem. I'll be watching. We, we got four high-level ones that are all very different just on them. Hunter Norzad. Of Penn State, former Cornell kid, started at guard, now at center. Great mover. Let's go, Big be, Red. He'll probably be your best <laughs> zone blocking uh, interior off of, or center. Um, Matt Lee, also an outstanding athlete. He'll be at the NFL Combine. He'll be a draft pick as well. Kind of that, a little bit smaller in terms of weight, but a zone blocking guy. Um, Dylan McMahon is probably the nastiest interior off the line we have, and he'll finish with authority from NC State. And then finally, Jalen Sundell from North Dakota State. He's played left tackle, center, guard. There are NFL personnel members who think he might be the most complete and talented offensive lineman they've had in the last four years. Um, in terms of he can play tackle, he can play center, he's played guard, and he's been at a key position on every one of those great offensive lines they've had too. So definitely the most versatile guy they've had in the last couple of years, and don't be surprised if he makes a big rise on draft right. <laughs> and he's already worn green and gold, so. There you go. <laughs> uh, flipping it over the interior defensive line, uh, kind of an underrated DT class overall this year. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great athletes. I mean, obviously Johnny yeah. Newton's like the, the top one that everybody looks at, but I would say two through seven. Yeah. Well, not for me. I have a, I have a different kid. I'm a big Byron Murphy guy. So I would, say, Byron, I would <laughs> say Byron Murphy will be the first D tackle taken and he's going to go in the top 11, 12 picks. Newton's definitely the biggest name, but when you're looking yeah. at, at just who was the best player, player this year it's it's probably yeah. byron murphy yeah. newton's still going to go in the first round tavondre sweat might go in the first round but like two through seven in the interior defensive like they're all going to be top yeah. 60 picks one of them being leonard taylor who's going to yeah. be at shrine this year still rehabbing from injury himself we might see him out there in the practice field um you know, it, it i i i kind of liken him to almost like a zay situation where i remember last year you know, Zay was like, ah, should I go? Should I not go? And then, you know, once you get out there and you see guys competing, yeah. you're like, I'm I'm better than them. And then Zay <laughs> went out there and he showed he's better than everybody. And I, I, yeah. I'm hoping we get a similar thing from Leonard Taylor this year. Uh, but I want you to talk about him a little bit because he he's probably going to be the top interior defensive lineman in this group in terms of draft status. Yeah, I would say for sure. And I think he, you know, they, they kind of Used him in ways Miami that I'd say I, I disagree with a little bit and how they maybe use him as a player. He was playing more nose. I think he's more of a three tech or or at least a little, you know, a little off the center because he can make so many plays too. But we watched film, me and Leonard the other day, um, you know, kind of getting him ready for the NFL when he's been going through that. And there's just some stunts he does that are just like, oh my God, like this guy moves incredibly well. He's playing zero shade in the center and he's got a stunt to get to the tackle. And he like gets the tackle in like two and a half steps, blows the guy up and takes the B gap over. You're just like, man, this guy could be used in so many ways too. And I think that's made him, I think, a better player is, you know, in college, sometimes you're, you're in a great position to be successful and you have a great career, you have a good NFL career. But sometimes when you're in college and you play a position you're not great at, but you develop skill sets you may not need to later on as well. I think Leonard's developed that. I think he's become much more versatile player because of it, but he's going to test through the roof. 
great kid, hungry to learn. Um, he's on me all the time to do more interview prep, watch more film together. Like he wants to be a great NFL player, especially after not having as productive of a year as he wanted to this year in the position he was in too. But, but no doubt he's definitely different than Tavondre Sweat, more in the miles of Byron Murphy, um, you know, aspect where he can play zero, one, three, but you want him in a spot where he can really rush the passer and be productive upfield too. And I think when it's all said and done, yeah, he'll be our, probably our highest drafted one, but probably someone who can go in the top, almost for sure in the top two rounds. Another DT that played in the same state that I'm really interested to see in person is Evan Anderson from Florida yeah. Atlantic. Yeah. That guy is not necessarily <laughs> the interior pass rusher, but he is a 100% absolute stump. Like, try and move that guy. Talk to me about Evan Anderson. Do, do not be low on him. And I think he he's probably he's probably two inches shorter than Broderick Martin. And Broderick's my guy, and he went top 100 picks by not being a combine guy. He really earned that process. But I think Evan is even maybe more NFL ready to be an interior nose tackle. And he is similar to Nathan Thomas, talking to Southeast area guys. Like, he had more executives going to Florida Atlantic than people realize, right? When executives are going to a school like Florida Atlantic early in the year, that shows, hey, this guy is legit and we want him. Um, so so no doubt Evan Anderson's well-known by NFL personnel. He had a great year for what he does. But again, he's a stump. He's not going to move. Also important, when he does have isolation, just him in the center as a pass rusher, he can win those reps and make plays. Um, he's played against power five components and done really well in those games as well, too. So I think Evan Anderson has a great chance to be that. You know, someday on the third round, hey, you know what? Maybe we didn't get Devondre or somebody else. We really need a nose tackle. That's what the Lions did in Broderick Martin a year ago is saying, hey, this is the best nose tackle left. We got to get him now in the third round. I think Evan is comfortably going to be in that range when it's all said and done. What do you think about the Timmy Jernigan comps that some people have thrown out? I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of like I, body I'm, body. I'm, can't move him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's a couple guys like him um, that kind of filled that role. But you know, and people talk about Michael Pierce. Oh, Pierce a little bit smaller as well, too. But similar type of like, hey, that guy's not going to move in the A gap. I, I think that's what NFL teams are going to say. And it's a good defensive tackle class, as you mentioned, a couple good nose tackles. But there's not many guys – 333 four that can move like him on the planet, not to mention this draft class. So <laughs> he'll be one of the top two or three no cycles drafted. And those guys usually go somewhere in the third round. Who's the the Kobe Turner in this year's group? And that people don't realize like Kobe Turner last year athletically, like he tested out of this world. Yeah. And so when he popped off this year, like we weren't super surprised, A, because we interviewed him last year and we're like, oh, he's really smart. He's he's a put together like human. And he's a freak athlete. Is there anybody in this year's Shrine Group where you you just know, even if the even if the rest of the world doesn't yet, but you just know, like when they start testing, they're going to put up some just absurd numbers. So first of all, Kobe, you know, in this job, I get lucky a lot, right? I get lucky. Hey, we had a guy at the Shrine Bowl, and I, I don't like to take too much credit. I was obsessed with Kobe Turner all season long, and you guys know me pretty well. You know, when I'm right, I like to jokingly, but but puff my chest out. And there were so many teams who were like, why wow, he invited Kobe Turner? What's going on? I'm like, just trust me, just trust me. And he has made me look like a genius. And I'm very lucky for that, too. But Kobe was a unicorn player. So who compares to Kobe Turner? It's like who compares to Brock Purdy? You're kind of just forcing them. That's not going to happen. But if I had to pick a couple guys that will test like that, um, Nathan Pickering from Mississippi State. He's 6'4", 300 pounds, not like Kobe. He's going to run. Again, high four nines, test super well, um, actually the same training facility and has the same people in his corner as Kobe did a year ago. So not a shocking kind of comparison there as well, too. And then Juwan Briggs um, from Cincinnati. He was on the freaks list. Um, he squats I don't know, a thousand pounds, something crazy. Right. And he'll run really well as well. Not That's probably facetious, but something crazy, like some crazy number. <laughs> I can't even imagine what that looks like in terms of plates on the side that he can squat and run and. I think those will be two of our best tests in the defensive line, too. And, and as you mentioned, there's not a lot of guys who are able to be capable nose tackles or defensive tackles who can rush the passer and test at that level, too. So the next Kobe Turner may not have one for a while, um, but those are two guys that jump out to me that'll be great testers. Uh, let's talk about the edge class. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with you, EJ, because, you know, he, he kind of looked at the roster before I did. And the name that jumped out to him was Sendiata Anderson. And like one of the first things he sent me was like, I don't care what day it is. We are interviewing him. Love that kid. I know starting with Sendiata Anderson, it seems like we're we're burying the lead, but he might be the lead. 
Yeah, I, he's incredibly productive and talented. And again, he, he struggled this year with some quote-unquote numbers because he's, again, by far the best player on that defense and teams are running away and scheming against him as well, too. But he's got the size. He'll be 6'2 and a half, 6'3, 245, 250 as a speed rusher. Um, he'll be on the 4-3 defense because he can't put his hand in the dirt and win there as well, too. But teams know how explosive and dynamic he really is. And I think he'll he'll be a guy that rises when it comes to the pro day circuit because he's going to test really well. But I think a good week here against, as you kind of mentioned earlier, really good offensive tackles, that's going to allow him to be, you know, I think some similarities last year um, to a couple of we had that went like late day three. I think he's probably a notch better than some of those guys that are, are going to be like immediate NFL edge rushers who can develop into starters in the long haul. Yeah, I've been waiting a year for this one because I wanted him to come out last year and he went back. And I, I think I put up a post last year and said, all right, I have to wait a year, but put this guy on your list because when he gets his chance, which is now, I think one of the most important things in him for practice this week is to show that athletic potential because the, the NFL teams out there with defensive line coaches who like developing players and don't necessarily want finished products are going to look at him and go, oh, yeah, get me that guy because I'm going to get a value on him. He's already got a couple of things he does well, and I can – fairly easily add some more things to that because he's got juice he's got size i think he does fit pretty well in a four or three especially the wider alignments getting out to the even to wide nine he's going to be able to win one-on-one versus even athletic tackles can't wait to see that guy are there any other edges um that that are homework for us to watch before we get to shrine next week that like absolutely 100 yep. percent need to talk to him need to study him yeah, a couple Who's guys. Guy? One, I, I'm sure I'm, I don't know. What, I know EJ watched a lot of Grambling State in South Dakota State, but I'm sure you've watched some Washington Huskies. Um, oh, a little bit this year. <laughs> um, uh, Zion Tupelo Fatui, um, you know, opposite Braylon Trice, and Braylon Trice is a stud. He'll be, I think, a first round pick when it's all said and done. But Zion's not too bad himself, and and he'll be a firm draft pick. Teams are excited about him again. We invited him a year ago. Um, wasn't fully healthy last year. Stayed in school. I think he made a great decision. Had an even better year this year, and. Um, really got a chance to show and tell his story a lot in the national perspective as well, too, about what he's overcome. So I think he's a firm draft pick and a great interview. I love him as well. Uh, David Aguebu from Houston. Um, he is a former top recruit with Oklahoma for a couple of years, part of those great linebacker units, but went to Houston on purpose because of their scheme and their coaching staff. He is a football junkie. He is right up your guy's alley. Definitely guy you'll want to talk to as well. And then, I can see all these guys as well, too. I want to keep it too long here. I'll say Khaled Duke from Kansas State. Um, I think people – he's a guy that also has overcome quite a bit early on in his life, but then also had some injuries and issues at Kansas State and has greatly overcome them. And I got a chance to go to Kansas State's practices and watch the team up close and personal. And guys like Cooper Beebe, who won't be at an all-star game this year, obviously impressive physical. KT Levison, one of our line, will be there as well, too. Both of those guys went against Duke in practice, and Duke beat them both consistently. Right. And obviously that's one on ones and he's a speed rush a little bit different too. But like you'll see that first snap quickness. That's like that guy can get off the ball and get up field quickly too. And another guy who again has a great story of what he's overcome in his college career and to be an NFL player. Let's talk about linebacker because you got Edger yeah. and Cooper. You yeah. the Texas AM kid, wanted to stay local ish. Uh <laughs> there's a lot of people that think he might be the first linebacker taken in this class. Do you agree? I'm one of them. Yes, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, he 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 jumped out right away again. He's a guy who put on A and M film, and you're like, who's that guy? Um, and he rose for us in the draft process preseason. We probably had somewhere in the early day three good athletes he puts all together. First couple of weeks, he's put it together. Let's see how he does. And then you see some plays where he's bursting through guards, making a play in the backfield, or he's getting out in space against outside zone or pitch plays or toss plays, or he's dropping in coverage and making a play. Like he can do, he's a, he's a complete three phase player as a, as a linebacker run defender and, and pass coverage guy. And he's going to test absolutely incredibly. So yes, I think he'll be the first linebacker taken and it might be by 10, 15 picks when it's all said and done. Really? Yeah. Wow. So are you thinking top 50, maybe you got a potential there? I wouldn't rule out first round when it's all said and done. I think that's how physically gifted he is. And it's, it's not a linebacker class that has a ton of top, two, three round guys. And I think he, he's shown the ability to be a three phase player. He can rush the passer, be a great run defender in space and in the traffic and in coverage. Um, he's a great interview, great kid. I think teams are going to say, you know what, like let's hit your wagon to him and not rush this. And I think a playoff team is going to say, Hey, we can get a linebacker like, you know, 
the bravest of what Patrick Queen late in the first round as well, too. Like, I think mm-hmm. that could be one of those type of like, hey, we're going to plug him in, be our inside linebacker, our mic, and, and have a playoff team off and running. Yeah, scarcity is going to be a factor this year in inside yep. linebacker class and it makes guys like him with talent in years when there are not, you know, tens of others right behind him. Teams get itchy and definitely could see, you know, last five picks of the first round, somebody going, look, we need one. We're not yep. going to get a better one. If we wait, we're going to end up waiting two or three rounds. Why shouldn't we do this now? One of the things I love about you, Eric, is that you are focused on the Northeast. Talk to us about Jackson Mitchell out of UConn. Yeah, um, incredibly productive. Um, I think teams will have questions on Kenny covering the pass game and can he be a three-down linebacker, but I think he is for sure a two-down linebacker. He reminds me a little bit in that mindset, a little bit different body type, but a guy we thought was crazy. He went, it was criminal. He went undrafted. Really two guys at linebacker for us the last couple of years. One is Jack Sanborn, one of your guys. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it compares yeah. to Jack Sanborn, <laughs> but the other one is Nate Landman, um, who yep. was the best two down run defender I had seen in college football that year. And I'm like, Hey, I, you know, maybe you can't take that guy in the top two, three rounds, but that guy's got to go day three falls out of the draft. Two years later, he's a starting player for the last couple of years. Jackson feels like that where, Hey, I know maybe the pass coverage stuff isn't there, but if you just don't use him there early on and let him be a guy that can really play against run on first down and second and short, be a sub package guy, he'll be your fourth linebacker early on in the NFL. And he's shown that over his college career that he can really finish through zone, be aggressive upfield, take on blockers at a high level and still work away from his frame, not leave and not lose gap integrity by being over aggressive, but still explosive upfield. Like all those little things you want a great run defending linebacker to have, he does at a high level too. Uh, In terms of coverage linebackers, not named Edge Cooper, uh, who sticks out to you in this group is somebody who's really going to shine you know, when we do the one-on-ones uh, in, and they got to cover guys in space? Uh, a couple guys. One, I think Steel Chambers, Ohio State, did a good job of that this year. I wouldn't say that's a strength, but I think he made a lot of huge strides there and, and had a lot of good coverage matchups. Obviously, Western Kentucky, I think he had an interception, a couple of great plays, but in some of their big games this year, he, he definitely wasn't a liability like teams thought he was coming into the year. Uh, Curtis Jacobs, probably our best tester outside of Edron Cooper. He'll be a top 100 pick, I think, when it's all said and done. Just a, a freak, freak athlete that – Kind of put in some tough spots this year at Penn State, but I think in the NFL, have a better NFL career. Dallas Gant of Toledo, um, former Ohio State kid himself. He'll be, I think, a riser in this draft process. Um, and then last one is, is Kalen Deloach from Florida State. Um, partially because he's a little bit undersized, kind of that 215, 220-pound linebacker, but a really special athlete, played a huge role for that defense. And I think he'll be a good coverage guy as well. Uh, defensive back. Yeah. So again, EJ's planted a lot of flags uh, so far, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Hardy he thinks might be the third. Wow, uh, a power five guy. Wow, <laughs> shocked. Well, <laughs> it's, no, but... it's not that. It's that he's again. We talked about scarcity with linebacker teams. I think teams again are ahead of you know they were ahead of draft media for a long time, and they're certainly ahead of the public with the value of nickel. Right. Yeah. Nickel is has been the new base for years now. And there was always that, oh, you can't take a nickel in the first round. And uh, as of two, three years ago, everybody's like, why not? He ends up yep. playing like 75 percent of the time. It's a super important and a very difficult role to learn. And I think Daquan Hardy's got a chance to be nickel back, you know, three in this class, maybe four when it's all said and done. Like going to test well because he's from Penn State. But tell us what you see of Daquan Hardy. <laughs> Well, first off, he's going to test well. And I think he and Tulu Griffin will be two of the four two guys at the combine this year. Um, and I think they, I mean, Daquan's already hit four three when he, before any training, right? He was like four three four before any training. So he's, he's one of those guys like Tyquan Thornton talked to his training facility and you're like, hey, I'm saying this. I don't believe it. I'm scared. But like he's four three four. I haven't taught him anything yet. Um, so he'll, he'll test super well as well, too. But we've got a bunch of nickels in this class. It just kind of worked out that way. We weren't trying to overdo it there, but. Um, you mentioned Daquan Hardy, uh, Jerry and Jones of Florida State will be kind of a, a nickel safety hybrid there. Tarheep still um, is a highly productive, maybe not as good of a tester as Daquan Hardy, but a really productive nickel corner as well. Um, and the one I want to call out, maybe you haven't watched it, maybe EJ has, I don't know, but South Dakota corner, Miles Harden. Now, he, <laughs> haven't gotten to him yet. He's a player that I'll call my shot that I think people don't know who he is quite yet, even NFL teams. Some teams definitely do. Um, and he has a combat but it's not quite the full Kobe Turner, but he's the player. I'm just telling you guys right now. I think he's one of the two or three best nickels in the draft. Uh, 
uh, it's like you can watch one game, go watch him against a, a decent receiver named Luther Burden, and come back. Oh, and tell yeah, me what you think. <laughs> he's okay. <laughs> and tell me what you think because that was the game that we already like Miles Harden already. But I was like, okay, this kid can handle it mentally. He'll play outside. He'll play nickel as well too. But a really good nickel class as well too. Hardy's going to be the fastest one. He'll be a draft pick for sure. But Miles Harden's guy also take a chance to look at before you get down there. Uh, Chikoze Anusium. Yeah, I I hope I did that name correctly. I'm gonna crush it. I'm doing pr- yeah. pronunciation practice throughout the next yeah. week. Uh, Colorado State again. EJ, yeah. huge fan of his too. He he got a much further head start on the DBs than me. And that was the first one he yeah. brought up. Of like, oh, he's good. Uh, yeah. How how high do you think he can go? Yeah, I mean he's a height weight speed guy, right? He he's gonna be six one plus two hundred pounds plus. He's gonna run the four fours, right? So first off, like you just check the box there. And, and good enough film, like he's going to be drafted. And I think once you're a player at that size where you showed like, hey, him and Jaquan Shepard of Maryland, another corner who's like high weight speed, productive, good college player, boom. When you already make that threshold that size, I don't know how early you can go in the draft, um, really. So I, I think Jagosi Anusium is going to go in the top four or five rounds. And if you're a top four or five round at that size, you know, going top three, four is not crazy either. But but very well, like we've got three Colorado State players. We mentioned Dallin Hoka earlier, Mo Kamara, their edge rusher, one of the leading edge rushers production wise in college football. And then Chagosi and Nuzian, who's a favorite of West Coast Scouts. All three of those guys are going to be um, very sought after for very different reasons. Holker, H back productivity, Mo Kamara, a little undersized, but, but 13 and a half sacks, I think, this year. And then Chagosi and Nuzian, height, weight, speed for days, and been a really productive player. He actually graded out as one of the best corners on our analytics in the entire country this year. Yeah, love him with his size, his physicality, his ability to play with that speed and straight line. It reminds me a little bit of a guy like Terrell Smith that people are going to look yeah. at that's physical, that can line up across from people. Um, not necessarily bang, but stay with them physically, which I think is even more important as a corner. And I think he's got a ton of potential. And, you know, again, scheme fit, super important for all corners in terms of technique and size and what they want to ask him to do. But I think he's going to fit in well over half the leagues, like sort of plug and play outside. And they're going to say, yeah, he can start as our third and work his way up. Just off the bus, guys, him, Jaquan Shepard, Tyler Owens of Texas Tech, um, Mikey Victor of Alabama State, you're going to see those guys and be like, yeah, please. Like, I, I want those guys. So a lot of players that are going to look the part, and I hopefully on the field as well, they show it. Now, I, I watch a lot of NFL football. Yeah. Watch a bunch of college football. Can't say I watch a lot of CFL these days. Uh, yeah. Please enlighten Fair. us on, on Quantes Stiggers and how a former Toronto Argonaut yeah, current. is going to be at the Shrine Bowl this year. <laughs> current. Yeah, this is uh, – I think this will be a real – it's a fascinating story. And I think Quantes has really earned his opportunity. Um, so by way of like, why is a current, a current CFL cornerback in the Shrine Bowl and in the draft process? So the way the CFL to NFL relationship works is that every year um, players that are on, you know, CFL teams require two-year contracts. So in, after your first year, they open up a window to allow NFL teams to work out CFL players and then sign them. And if you will get signed in that window, you're free to go. If you don't, then you're on another year in your contract. Um, probably 25 plus teams were like, we want to work him out. And by background, uh, Quantes, and by the way, he couldn't work out for NFL teams because they haven't gone through the draft process yet. Why is that? He never played college football, was going to go to Lane College, a D2 school. Something happened in his life. He couldn't go to college. Played in the fan-controlled football league. His first game, he had three interceptions. I had like eight on a six-game season. Toronto team, and, and I'll give my shout-out to his assistant GM, Vince Magri, who did a fantastic job worked him out, signed him, goes to Toronto this past year, CFL Rookie of the Year, dominates. Six foot, six one, 200 pound cornerback. He's going to run a 4'4", four, 4'5", four, four, training for the draft process. But because he's only four years out of high school and never went through an NFL draft process, he has to go through one. And teams, NFL teams cannot work him out, right? I was telling him today, you know, you can be automatically eligible for the NFL draft if you are five years out of high school, no matter what you did, right? I was eligible for the NFL draft after four years at Delaware. I didn't get drafted, so I could sign the NFL team tomorrow, but Quantes never had that opportunity. So he'll go through the draft process like everybody else. He's training for the combine down in Atlanta. And again, I, I, I've watched the CFL film. It's obviously impressive. And for NFL teams, they have too. The question now is, how do you use CFL film as a pro personnel side to ship that to the college personnel side too? So it's going to be fascinating for every NFL team. But I'll tell you this. 
we would not have taken this unique situation if I wasn't pretty darn sure that he was going to be a draft pick when it's all said and done based on how he plays in the NFL and certainly his NFL interest. When, when 20 plus teams are want to sign you and then you have to go through the draft process, those guys don't fall out of the draft. Yeah. It's a crazy one. I've you know yeah. been doing this for 11 years. You don't years. watch fan control football league. I did watch <laughs> a little fan control football league. That was the one that I, I am a degenerate, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I've never seen yeah. a process where someone was a rookie of the year in one of the best professional football leagues in North America yeah. and yet gets to go back into the draft. That's that's a new one for me. Crazy. Fascinating. Can't wait to see it. And again, the physical tools are there. This is not a like, oh, he didn't get any, you know, didn't get any college offers because he's five, seven and a half. Uh uh-uh. uh. Like no. has the physical yeah. tools, has already shown it in a professional setting, and now gets to sort of, you know, back to the future through the draft. It's it's just a fascinating story. Are there any safeties before we get out of here that stick out to you that, that we should uh, be paying attention to? You know, it's, it's fun <laughs> because we've got a bunch of uh, teammates, right? We mentioned the two Florida state guys, Jerry and Jones, Renato green corners, Tarheep still um, and Jaquan Shepard, um, two Texas tech players, uh, Daydream Taylor Demerson goes by rabbit and Tyler Owens. Um, rabbit is more of the nickel, corner safety hybrid kind of player who has some, you know, Tyron Matthew ish kind of play sometimes on film. Tyler Owens is going to run something crazy in every single drill, jump vertical, jump 40 inches, run a four, three, something at, at six, two, he'll be really impressive. A um, couple of guys I'm really excited to see that. I think we're, we're pretty bullish on Omar Brown from Nebraska. High character kid, versatile, can play corner, can play safety. He'll be really impressive. We could practice uh, another game. I think you watch this one, Brett uh, Washington, like Zion to I'm not sure if EJ watched those guys, but Dominic Hampton, Gonna test really well. We actually invited yeah. him a year ago as well, um, yep. and he had to stay in school and, and have a great run. He'll test very well too. But I think safety's probably our safety and corner probably our deepest groups right now. Just in terms of likelihood of draft picks, we'll probably have you know more than half of these players will be drafted, and probably a third of them will draft in the top three four rounds. It's that deep of a class. And that's one of the position groups where you can pull somebody even in the fifth round that's going to yeah. come in and start and play. Like we look at Keytrail Clark last year. You know, Steel. which first of all shouldn't have gone as late as he did. Yeah, but ridiculous. He, it was so easy to look at him as like a day three guy and be like, "Yeah, he's going to play like seventy percent of their snaps and be good." Like just off the cuff, he's going to be good, and he was. Yeah, and and this is one of the few position groups where I think you can you can, I don't want to say, uh, you know, go value shopping, but yeah, you can go value shopping because there's just so many of them. Keytrell and and EJ's guy, Jack Sanborn, were two of my big, like, what the F are we doing here? Like, these are obviously NFL players, and and obviously Jack went on draft, and Keytrell went went fifth round. A couple guys this year, and we'll see how the process goes, right? I have my favorites, and guys I think will be a little early, people think right now, too. But the great part about the the Shrine Bowl and the NFL Combine is you guys can go earn it. And I think I, especially in DB, a lot of these players, Josh Wallace, you know, former UMass corner, goes to Michigan and starts. He's been impressive as well, too, in this year as a Michigan defender, too. I think he'll, he'll get a chance to really earn his opportunities this year in the draft process. A lot of these guys will. Yeah, Dominique uh, reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, a former Washington safety in terms of Miles Bryant, a guy that didn't yeah. make a ton of waves but was really important. You saw the UW defense play better when Hampton came back and people talked about, hey, man, we were missing him. And people look at film and they say, well, you know, he doesn't do that much, but he's one of those guys, the teammates say, he's doing a lot, fills in the gaps, doesn't necessarily get the spotlight, not going to blow guys away at the combine. And I'm not saying he plays the same with the same style as Miles does. Uh, I think Hampton's maybe a little bit more physical than Miles was, but, you know, I hate to use the term, but glue guy, you know, yeah. he's going to come in, he's going to be able to play special teams, he's going to be a third safety right off. And you're going to see that guy in a couple of years, just like Miles, like, hey, where'd that guy come from? Why is he starting? And I think Hampton can take a very similar path. Well, we've been through a lot of names so far, and that was still probably only about 20% of the total <laughs> officers. Right. Uh, EJ and I are going to have a, a lot of opportunities to talk with these guys. You know, we're, we're going to be on the sidelines at every single practice. Uh, we'll be trying to overhear conversations between GMs and agents, you know, all the normal sleuthing that we tend to do. Um, <laughs> but we'll be we'll be floating around the practice facility uh, at the star all week, trying to get a handle on what is quite possibly the deepest draft class that we've seen in quite some time. Uh, Eric, is there anything we need to know 
about Shrine Week uh, in terms of where to catch it, how to watch it, how to follow it. What's your recommendations? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, practice will be um, partially streamed on NFL Network. We'll also have access. Anybody wants to watch some of practice, you'll get it uh, via DB Sport. Um, there'll be a link that goes out sometime early next week of how you can access film right away. One of the cool things we've done in part with DB Sport is that everybody can virtually, whether you're at the facility, at practices or not, can watch film right away. Um, we want to hear from people and saying how guys have done last year. A lot of Kobe Turner highlights came out day one into a practice, whether they were at the Shrine Bowl or not. And that's always fun to see as well, too. So follow along um, to, watch, to, to watch practice virtually. NFL Network will cover our practice. Obviously, our game day is NFL Network uh, February 1st on Thursday Night Football. And then, of course, you, know, you guys will be down there and having some people uh, meet up as well, too, for your meetup as well, too. So appreciate you guys being down here and getting some great content all week long. We will see you in a week. Thank you very much for coming on.